This is a re-recording of the talk that I gave at the We Are Church gathering on a Sunday the 26th of June uh, when we met together. We tried to record the session and unfortunately the audio uh, was a bit of a mess and so I have had requests from people who really want this content uh, to be available to share with others and to work through uh, maybe uh, slowly and pause the video every now and again. So I'm very, very happy to do that. Uh, if you're watching this video, my name is Graham Codrington. I am married to Jane Codrington, who is the facilitator. I'm not sure we're calling her the leader yet, but uh, is the uh, binding force of a group of people who have, during COVID, uh, gathered together in a WhatsApp group. Uh, most of us are people who are trying to find uh, new ways uh, of being Christian. Um, uh, many of us have had uh, a history with Christianity and we, we want an, a new approach to Christianity. A Christianity that is inclusive. A Christianity that welcomes uh, everybody. A Christianity that uh, revels in the diversity of cultures and languages and uh, and expressions. And uh, we sort of found each other online. And now as COVID ends, are possibly looking to see what might happen if we begin to meet together uh, face to face. We meet uh, in uh, the leafy suburbs of Johannesburg. And we'll see what happens and where we go. But one of the things that we are passionately committed to as a group of people, is this idea of inclusion, and in particular, the inclusion and affirmation of LGBTQI people, by which we mean that not only do we want LGBTQI people to join our faith community so that they can come and be healed and saved and sorted out, <laughs> No, uh, we believe that LGBTQI people were created by God to be who they are and we welcome and affirm them in our community and ask them to be everything that they are, to become more Christ-like in who they are and to contribute fully and entirely uh, to our community. And we realize that for many of us, we grew up in environments, in, in Christian uh, environments, where that wasn't the case. Many of us want to um, include and affirm our LGBTQI friends and family and to see the goodness and the godness in them. But we've grown up in environments where we believe that the Bible says, or at least we were taught at Sunday school that the Bible says that God hates gay people. Or at least God loves them, uh, but they're sinners and they're going to hell if they don't repent of their gay lifestyle. And so what do we do, right? What do we do with that? And what do we do with, with our, our history? Do we abandon the Bible for the love of our family and friends? Or as many people have done, do we abandon our family and friends uh, for the love of our Bible? Or, or is there another way that doesn't abandon either? And maybe that third way is to recognize that we have misinterpreted Scripture, or possibly misinterpreted Scripture. It wouldn't be the first time in history that Christians have had to say, whoops, I'm sorry we got that wrong. I mean, I can think off the top of my head of Copernicus and Galileo, right? Scientists who looking at the stars and the planets and, and I'm saying, I, I don't think we've got it right, people. I don't think that the earth is the center of the universe. I think as it happens, the sun might be the center and we're going around the sun. And Christians and the church said, no, on the basis of the Bible, verses like, the, the, the heavens are built on the pillars uh, of, of the earth, that, that we are the center of God's universe and creation. And 
now that you start to look for the verses that people use, you, you realize they're not there. Because our new understanding of science means we go back and look at the Bible and we say, oh, that was poetry or that m meant something else. Um, uh, the church at the time didn't say, uh, whoops, we got it wrong. The church at the time asked those gentlemen to recant their views on pain of death. And it was only a few centuries later, um, only a couple of decades ago, I think, that Galileo was finally given a pardon by the Roman Catholic Church. So even when we know we're wrong, we can still hang on to our old beliefs way too long. But take slavery as another example, right? Um, throughout history, people have kept slaves, and many of them have looked at the Bible and said, well, the Bible says we can have slaves. And then some people say, no, no, the Bible doesn't really mean slavery. It, it, we can just interpret those verses as, as bosses and employees, right? Um, and, and so we don't, don't worry about the slavery stuff, except <laughs> there are some verses in the Bible that uh, allow you to beat your slave, right? And, and say, so as long as you don't beat your slave uh, to the point that they can't work for you for a few weeks in a row and you don't beat them to death, go ahead. When I when I said this in in, in front of the uh, in front of the community on Sunday, there there was a snigger, and as I looked around the room, I realized there were a few people who are who are bosses, who are fairly high up in their organizations, and I think they were wondering if they could use some of those verses. They might have a few employees who could do with a good beating. Okay, we we joking, right? We don't joking. Don't don't take that sort of thing too seriously. Obviously not, and that's the point we're making, right? that you can't just go to the Bible and say, the Bible says, because, well, the Bible did say that, but maybe it said it at a different time in history. Maybe it said it with a different purpose, or maybe we've just misinterpreted it um, and need to update our, our thinking. I grew up in a church that said, if science and the Bible disagree, don't worry, science will eventually catch up. I don't think that's true. I don't think history has borne that out. I, I think that's a, a, actually a, a really stupid statement to make on the basis of church history. Um, yeah, science might have a few things wrong and update things, but when science is, is fairly certain about what it's got and then it contradicts the Bible, maybe it's inviting us to say that we are the ones who have misinterpreted the Bible. I'm not necessarily saying the Bible is wrong, um, I'm just saying we have misinterpreted it. But we'll come back to that thought a little bit later because I think the big thing we've got wrong is what the Bible actually is. It's not an encyclopedia. It's not a rule book. It's not a textbook. It's not a constitution. But what is it? So what we wanted to do with this talk was to have a look at the seven verses, and there are only seven verses, four in the Old Testament, three in the New Testament, that look at the issue of LGBTQI people. Jesus never mentioned it, right? Uh, it's not mentioned in Jesus. The, the, the prophets don't refer to it. There's, there's just four Old Testament verses, three references from Paul in letters uh, that he wrote. Um, and I want to talk about how we've got it wrong. Um, my background is I am a theologically trained uh, and ordained a pastor. Um, I went all the way up to masters uh, in my the theology, won the prizes for Greek and Hebrew and for theology. Uh, and I've been studying this stuff, investigating it, and I've been on a journey for the last 20 years. Uh, to, to look at this. And I believe that when we look at the Bible and those seven verses, there are ways to say the Bible is right. This thing that I read here is correct, uh, but we have misinterpreted it, and here's another way to interpret it. Not, not a weird, wild, made-up way that's trying to make something up to justify uh, a, a, a view, but... I want to show you that there are clear, obvious ways to read the text that are clear in the text that don't require a master's in theology to understand, 
Um, but that you will see that there is a different interpretation of these verses, which leaves us in the position of saying there are no verses in the Bible that say that LGBTQI people are, are sinful and evil and an abomination in the sight of God and will go to hell unless they repent of their lifestyle. I don't think the Bible says that. So let me prove this to you. The first two verses come from Genesis 19 and Judges 19 and 20. And you probably haven't heard of the Judges 19 and 20 verses because it's one of the most brutal stories in, 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 in the Bible and I'm sure you've never had it uh, talked about at Sunday school or a sermon. Um, uh, priest and, 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 and uh, a woman uh, visit a, a house uh, the people of the village don't like the fact that they've, that they've visited. Uh, they ask um, for the priest to be sent out to be killed. The, the, the host doesn't do that, but he sends the woman out. Uh, the village rapes the woman to death. Um, well, actually, not quite to death, to unconsciousness. Uh, but then in the morning, the, 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 the priest and, and, and the host to say, well, this woman's useless now, and they cut her into 12 pieces, and, and they send the pieces of her body to the 12 different tribes of Israel. Yeah, yeah you haven't heard this story, have you? Um, and, and some of the tribes get very offended by this, and, and, and um, they get together and they come and attack this village and kill everybody in it. Um, it, it yeah, yeah, and it just like brutal. Judges 19 to 20, okay. It is very similar to the story you are probably quite familiar with, which is in Genesis 19, which is Sodom and Gomorrah, which kind of has the, the same theme and the same tone. Some people think it's basically the same story retold. Um, anyway, we don't have to get into that. But the one we know and the one that's referenced elsewhere in the Bible is Sodom and Gomorrah. Um, Abraham's nephew Lot was lit, living there and it, it was a rough place. Uh, it wasn't a good place to live and God said, right, I'm going to destroy those, uh, those cities. Um, don't want Sodom and Gomorrah uh, to be in existence anymore. And God then sends a message to Lot to get him out. And the message comes in the form of angels. We know that. Lot doesn't know they're angels. They are just visitors. Lot takes them in. Now, Lot is a foreigner living in these in these cities and now more foreigners come and Lot takes them in to give them supper and to give them a, a place to stay and that's kind of breaking the protocol uh, of how visitors work and we don't not quite sure in the story exactly what happens but the, the city's not happy and they come to Lot and they say you shouldn't have these visitors overnight um, send them out uh, to us um, and, and Lot says, no, no, I won't send them out. He, he actually says, I'll send my daughters if you want them, um, <laughs> but then doesn't. Um, and uh, basically the, the city says, no, we, we want to rape these men. Um, now, uh, and, and then that doesn't happen. Uh, the angels leave, the Lot escapes, the city's destroyed. And what people then say is it's because of homosexuality that God destroyed uh, Sodom and Gomorrah. But that is just not true. I mean, if you've just heard the story I've told you, uh, the, the issue is not a homosexuality there. The issue is rape and, and abuse. And God had already decided to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah long before we discover in the story that there's homosexual rape involved here. And we need to understand culturally that raping a, a man, homosexual rape, was used to degrade a person. In fact, most rape throughout history, almost all rape, is about power. And, and, and it's not about enjoying a sexual experience and having sexual um, pleasure. It's about power um, and power over uh, somebody else. Almost uh, all, all rape is that. And uh, this used to happen often in war. When, you, when they were in the ancient Near Middle East, they would go out and have war. When they'd beaten the other army, uh, the people they hadn't killed, they would rape them. And, and that was a way of degrading them and saying, I am better than you. I am more powerful than you. You are less than me. And it's got nothing to do with, uh, well, it's certainly got nothing to do with LGBTQI loving relationships, obviously. But it's also got nothing to do with homosexuality. If, if the angels had been women, 
the men would have raped them too. Um, and that's what the Judges 19 and 20 story tells us, because they raped a woman in that story. Um, and uh, so it's not about homosexuality. It's not about LGBTQI. It's about rape. So I look at that uh, uh, passage and I say, <laughs> let's read that story today. Because we shouldn't be raping people, right? But it goes further than that. Because you don't have to believe me and, and my studies of ancient Near Eastern culture and things like that. Because the Bible itself tells us uh, about what the sins of Sodom uh, and Gomorrah were. Um, uh, do a search um, uh, uh, through the Bible for yourself. I, you don't have to believe me here. Do a search for yourself on where the Bible mentions Sodom uh, and Gomorrah. And, and you will discover that, and I'm just getting the exact number as I'm talking to you here, um, that there are, like, I mean, I think it's close to 20 different references that other verses in the Bible have. So Ezekiel 16, verse 49, Isaiah 1, verses 9 to 10, Jeremiah 23, verses 14, Zephaniah 2, verse, uh, verses 9 to 10. Um, and uh, so the list goes on. I'll pause the video again if you want to get that full list. Um, but it says, these are the sins of Sodom. And uh, it, it, it says in Ezekiel 16, for example, let me read it to you. Uh, Sodom and Gomorrah and her daughters were arrogant, overfed and unconcerned. They did not help the poor and needy. They, were, uh, they walked around uh, the city dripping with gold jewelry, walking past poor people who were in need of food and not caring. And they were inhospitable to strangers. When, when foreigners and people came to their city, they, they sent them away. This is the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah. Jesus himself talked about this. Jesus sent, sent his disciples out to do ministry in various villages. Some of them came back and said, these villages don't want to hear from us. And Jesus said, well, wipe the dust off your feet. So there's literally nothing left of that village on you. Literally the dust of your feet. It will be as bad for them as it was for Sodom. Why? Because they had not been hospitable. They had not welcomed foreigners. Now, if you are South African and watching this, and it's 2022, somewhere around there, I wonder how, uh, how relevant a story about rich people making their way through a city filled with poor people who, who did nothing for the poor people. I wonder how relevant that feels to you as a story, whether it's worth telling that story and, and finding out if, if rich people ignoring poor people is, is problematic. I wonder if a story about not being welcoming to foreigners, maybe even doing violence against foreigners is, is of any relevance. And for those of you who are not South African, maybe not following the news, South Africa, sadly, like other countries, like some American border states, some United States of America southern border states, has suddenly got very, very xenophobic over the last little while with, with a new group coming up called Dudula who are rabidly anti-foreigner and are literally burning down foreigners' houses and businesses and trying to chase them all out of the country. So, I mean, let me not make it hypothetical. Let me be clear. I think we should be preaching the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. And the story of Sodom and Gomorrah is about rich people ignoring poor people and then rich and poor people being violent against foreigners. That's the story. And God says, stop doing that, people. Don't do that. It makes God angry. Let's read the Bible. Let's preach the Bible. Let's tell the story of the Bible. But let's not pretend that the Bible is talking about loving LGBTQI relationships and LGBTQI people in general in, in, in the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. It just isn't. Okay, so we're two verses down. We've got five to go. 
we next need to go to Leviticus, which I said the Bible isn't a book of rules. Well, Leviticus is, in fact, a book of rules. Or, in fact, Leviticus 17 to 23, 24 is specifically a book of rules. It's called the Holiness Code, sometimes the Household Codes. And we go to Leviticus 18, verse 22, and Leviticus 20, verse 13. Now, Leviticus 20 is just a repeat of Leviticus 18. That is a list of things you shouldn't do, but Leviticus 20 gives the punishments that go along with it. So we can just, let's focus on Leviticus 18, uh, verse 22. And uh, this is fascinating. If you read through the list of things that are prohibited, it, it's actually a remarkable list because it includes things like uh, getting tattoos. It includes things like having sex with, gee, there's a list of things you're not supposed to have sex with, including, and I don't know if this is useful information, you are not to have sex with your mother-in-law. <laughs> Did anybody need that rule? <laughs> Apologies, my mother-in-law, if she ever watches this video. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, there really is a long list. Um, and you kind of think, well, okay, that's a good list. Except if it was meant to be a complete list of things you're not supposed to have sex with, uh, your daughter is not included in that, just by the way. So if you think it's a comprehensive sexual ethics list, there's one thing that in that's included that probably didn't need to be, and one major thing that probably should have been included that wasn't there. And maybe that's a hint to us that it isn't what you think it is. And, well, we don't need a hint because if you go to the beginning of chapter 17, you can go to the beginning of chapter 18, you can go to the beginning of chapter 20, you can go to the beginning of chapter 21, you can also look at the end of each of those chapters and you will discover a very clear context. The context is that Israel is now establishing themselves as a small little up-and-coming nation in the middle of a whole lot of other hostile nations. These other nations around them all worship different gods. And Israel, as we know, the distinctive characteristic of Israel is they are to worship Yahweh, the God that revealed himself to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Um, and back in Genesis 12 to say, you will be my people and I will be your God and you will be special. Um, and now in Leviticus, uh, God is saying with a list of laws saying, do not be like the surrounding nations. Do not follow the laws and customs of the surrounding nations. And the one particular nation uh, that always seems to come up is the Philistines. And one of the rituals that the Philistines had was linked to a god called Molech or Molech. And this was linked to fertility. It was linked to harvests and rains and, 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 and having babies and fertility. Um, and the temples of Molech had all sorts of rituals that these surrounding nations had to fulfill. So if you wanted the rain to come, if you wanted to have a good harvest, if you wanted to have a child, you had to go to the temple and do all sorts of things. You had to get tattoos on your body. You had to shave your hair. Um, you had to wear certain clothes. You also had to have massive sexual orgies where you were having sex with all sorts of people and all sorts of things. Um, and in extreme circumstances, when there's massive long periods of drought, there was also both animal and human sacrifice, sacrificing children. And Leviticus 17 to 24, the Holiness Code, is saying, do not copy the surrounding nations. You don't have to do all of that stuff to get my attention, says Yahweh, says the God of, of the Jewish nation. God says, speak to me and I will listen. But you don't have to do all of that crazy stuff. In fact, I tell you, you mustn't do it. You must be different. You must be holy. In this case, holy doesn't mean sacred. It doesn't mean pure. It means separated and different and set aside for sacred use. And that's what Israel as a nation was supposed to be, different from all of the surrounding nations. 
And so this, this chapter, R18 and chapter 20 of Leviticus, is not a comprehensive list of sexual ethics. It's not an encyclopedia of rules to obey. It is a list of the things that the surrounding nations did in their temples that God is saying you mustn't do. Or maybe even is just saying you don't have to do. Some of the things you mustn't do, like kill your children. And here's an interesting thing. If you're looking in your Bible, Leviticus 18.22 is the verse, and we'll talk about that one in a second, is the verse that talks about uh, men having sex with men. But Leviticus 18.21, the verse just before it, talks about child sacrifice. And that's a very weird two things to put right next to each other. And then if you look at verse before that, in verse 20, it talks about not having sex with your wife when she has her period, when she's menstruating. What is this list? What, why are these things in this list? And the answer is that it's got to do with the temple rituals. It's got to do with what the surrounding nations were doing and God saying, don't do that. It's not got to do with loving LGBTQI relationships. And it's not got to do with whether you're gay or homosexual, lesbian or transgender or anything else. It's not got to do with whether you are accepted by God. It's got to do with whether you do something unacceptable as a form of temple worship to try and get God's attention. And in Leviticus 18.22, it's a very interesting Hebrew phrase. It's very weird, actually. There's no other time in any other literature or anywhere else in the Bible that this particular phrasing is used. It says, you must not sleep or lie, sorry, you must not lie with a man the lyings of a woman. That's the exact translation. Now, it does mean you shouldn't, men shouldn't have sex with men, right? So I'm not arguing about that. Nobody argues about the meaning of it. It's just a strange way to say it. And I'll explain why uh, in a few minutes. But uh, uh, men must not lie with men the lyings of a woman. Um, but it's not saying that as a general rule for all time anywhere, uh, everywhere. Uh, the same as in a few verses earlier, it talks about not getting tattoos. That's not a forever for everybody law. That's about not getting tattoos in order to try and get God's attention. Not getting tattoos as part of a temple ritual. It's about not having sex when your wife has her period. Maybe for uh, hygiene reasons, but as part of a ritual in a temple to get God's attention so that you'll get the rain to come. Don't do that. I think we can still preach these scriptures. I think we probably should preach these scriptures that you don't get the rain to come and you don't improve your harvest by having sex with a whole lot of different people. Um, one final thought is that if this was meant to be an, a law, an anti-LGBTQI law, well then why does it, mention, why does it not mention women? Why doesn't it say that women shouldn't have sex with each other in the way that you would have sex with men? Um, why doesn't it mention cross-dressing and transgender? Uh, those things did exist back then. It only mentions this one thing, and it mentions it in a strange way. I think that Leviticus is very, very clear. It's about temple rituals, and it's not about LGBTQI people or loving gay relationships. Simple. So, four verses down, we finished with the Old Testament. Let's go to the New Testament. And here we go to 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 to 11, and 1 Timothy 1, verses 8 to 11. Um, in fact, these were pretty much sent to the same person, because Timothy, who was a person, and he ended up being the senior pastor at the church in Ephesus, so the letters to Timothy were essentially also sent to Ephesus. And then uh, he was at, we think, the time the first letter to Corinth was sent. He was actually working there uh, in, in Corinth. Um, and Corinth and Ephesus both had a temple to Diana. Now Diana is 
the Greek slash Roman uh, is, is the modern, uh, at that time, version of Molech, okay? the fertility goddess. And a lot of the things that were done back in the temples of Molech were now being done in the temples of Diana. And you can still go to Ephesus. I've been to Ephesus. I've been to Corinth. Um, uh, in Ephesus, you've got the temple. You've got the, the city laid out for you. It's a remarkable place to visit. And at the temple, that was where all the meat was taken and the meat was sacrificed to animals, so animals were sacrificed and then cut into meat and you had to buy your meat from the temple. So you were buying meat that was part of a sacrifice um, to a goddess for fertility purposes. There were also prostitutes uh, at the temple uh, that you could literally just visit them. People would openly visit them. And the Romans in particular, and, and the Greeks as well, uh, but definitely the Romans, the Roman men much preferred to use young boys as prostitutes rather than women. Um, and uh, as I say, many, many of the Greek intellectuals did. I, we, we're not quite sure about the, the average Greek person, but certainly the Greek intellectuals and the Romans, they were young boys kept at the temple to be prostitutes. These were not sex workers who had made a decision to this is the way I'm going to make my money. These were people who were probably kept enslaved, to be honest. They were, they were kept there um, in horrible conditions uh, to be prostitutes. Women and then also these, these young boys, uh, which was the, the, the preference. So that's the context, right, um, in, in, in which Paul is writing. And it's fascinating that the two letters that are written that include LGBTQI references, Corinthians and Timothy, are sent to the two cities that were centers of the worship of Diana. So it's not in the other letters that were sent to, to other places and other people. And the, the only other place was Rome, which was, of course, the center of, of the whole Roman thing and, and also had a temple to Diana. So it's fascinating that the three main places in, in which you had these fertility um, let's call them cults again. Those are the letters that include these references. So anyway, let me make a stronger connection to you here because in these verses, in, in 1 Corinthians and 1 Timothy, Paul uses a word called arsenokoitos. That's the Greek word, arsenokoitos. That's the word that is translated homosexual. So if you are reading and if you go and read uh, 1 Timothy, for example, you, you will see that there's a list of people who won't get into the kingdom of heaven, a list of people who are considered sinners and distant from God. And, and included in the list is, depending on your version of the Bible, is homosexuals or homosexual offenders. At least some versions of the NIV are gracious enough to recognize that there might be a difference between a homosexual and a homosexual offender. Um, you know, like there might be a difference between an Englishman and an English offender, okay? It's not just the same thing. It's not just saying a homosexual is an offender. It's saying there are homosexuals, and then there are homosexuals who are offenders. And so what are they doing that is offensive? Well, the word is interesting, because arsenokoitos is a made-up word. It doesn't appear anywhere. Paul made it up, right? It wasn't in use. It wasn't in any dictionary. And, if, and when Paul sent these letters, people would have said, what's that? I've never heard of this. But they would have been able to work it out because it's made up of two words, arsenal, which essentially means man, and koitos, which essentially means sex, right? So it's man's sex. But more importantly, it comes from Leviticus 18. That weird phrase I was talking to you about, a man shall not lie with a man the lyings of a woman, in the Greek translation of that verse, it's called the Septuagint, in that translation, which is the translation that people would have known, that Paul would have been familiar with, you can see arsenos and koitos next to each other as words. It's, it's like a weird pattern. And everybody who was familiar with the scriptures would have said, arsenokoitos, I've heard that before, arsenokoitos. And then obviously 
some of the more theologically trained people would say, yeah, it comes from Leviticus 18 verse 22. And then they'd go back and they'd say, well, what was going on back then? And they would have had the same lesson I've just given you. So this is about the temple. This is about the, the rituals of the surrounding nations and that you shouldn't be involved in them. Do you know what? Nobody disagrees with what I've just said. Even the most conservative people who think gay people are going straight to hell, do not pass, begin, do not collect your, uh, your money, go straight to hell. They believe what I've just told you, right? The most conservative scholars are in agreement. Paul made up the word and he borrowed it from Leviticus 18. So whatever you believe about Leviticus 18, you have to apply to 1 Corinthians and 1 Timothy. And I think it's clear that it's about temple rituals. But I can go further than that because I can show you in the verses themselves that that's what it's about. Let's have a look at 1 Timothy. Um, so in 1 Timothy chapter 1, you've got this list of, um, of, of things that will keep you out of the kingdom of God, right? Things that will exclude you from God's presence. But there's this amazing pattern uh, in them, and you'll see they grouped together. So if you have a look at the list, it's lawbreakers and rebels, right? So people who break the law. Then it's the ungodly and the sinful. So they're not just breaking the law of the country, they're also break, breaking God's law. They are ungodly and sinful. Then the third is they are unholy and irreligious, right? So, so they're going further than just breaking God's law. They're actually opposing God. And Paul's using two words each time, unholy and irreligious. Then he goes to three. He goes, there are father killers, mother killers, and murderers. Okay, So these are murderers, right? But because he wanted to separate people who kill their father, people who kill their mother, I don't know why he separated that out. Um, but there are people who kill their parents, and there are murderers. Then there's sexually immoral, arsenokoitos, and slave traders. I'll come back to that translation in a second. So another three things. So father killers, mother killers, murderers. That's a clear grouping. Then sexually immoral, arson, quote, slave traders, weird. And then a final grouping of liars and perjurers, right? So the liars and perjurers is obviously together. So everything makes sense in this pattern, except for sexually immoral, arson, quote, and slave traders. Now, if I'm right, that arsenokoitos is saying that it's about the temple ritual of prostitution. It's about men having sex with other men, possibly men having sex with prostitutes. Then that makes sense. It's the sexually immoral people having sex with prostitutes, the arsenokoitos people having sex forced sex with young boys and slave traders. Why the slave traders? Well, how do you think the prostitutes and young boys got to the temple? So the, ver the verse is saying, people who go and have sex with prostitutes at the temple as part of a ritual uh, uh, to, to Diana, people who go to the temple and have forced themselves on, on young boys who have been trapped there against their will and the people who bring the prostitutes and young boys to the temple all of you all of you God is angry none of that is acceptable when you go to 1 Corinthians you you add in the word malakos which uh, is technically means soft um, but what often people have said is if arsenokoitos is the person who comes to the temple to have sex, so is the more the aggressive one, that the malakos is the soft one, that's the receiving side. If you are not an enslaved boy, obviously if you're an enslaved boy, there's, then we must rescue you and get you out of that. But if you choose to go to the temple, and make yourself available for prostitution. That's also a problem. And I think that's what 1 Corinthians adds uh, to, to, to the mix. So, I think you see that in Corinthians and Timothy, we've got a consistent picture 
of God's instructions. You are not to force yourself on anybody else. Any sex that you have should be done within the context of a consensual, loving relationship. You should not have sex as part of the worship of God or as part of any temple rituals. And you don't need to do any of this in order to get God's attention. Let's preach the Bible. I don't think we need to throw out the Bible. I don't think we need to ignore the Bible. I don't think we need to say the Bible is outdated on these topics. I think those messages are clear. I think they're good messages. By the way, up until 1947, every single translation of the Bible translated the word arsenokoitos as, well, not homosexual, not even homosexual offender, but as pederasty. And that's not a word we use today, but pederasty is uh, an adult male who forcibly has sex with young boys, a pederast. Uh, comes from the Greek word about uh, pido, which is which is children, pedo, you know, as in pediatrics, um, and so that's how most biblical translations were translated until 1947. And it does make a difference which words you use. And so arsenokoitos and malakos are referring to people who rape other people. It's not referring to loving relationships. Right, so now we get to Romans chapter 1. And Romans chapter 1 is, I think, where we should get to. So I, I think everything I've said so far, if you can take people through this conversation, and if they are prepared to open their minds, I, I think they will see uh, what I have shown you. Um, again, if they don't want to open their minds, if they've pre approved their hatred of gay people, then they will just keep that prejudice with them. And, they, you know, they'll use the Bible to, to back up their prejudice rather than looking at what's in the Bible and, and changing their hearts and their lives on the basis of what they see. But Romans 1 um, is, 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 a, is a bigger verse. Um, it, it's it's a, a, a whole section of, of a chapter. And the context that you need, and for those of you who heard me do this live, I'm about to take a few minutes longer. Um, uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm getting into this. So apologies that this is ending up being a, a, a longer uh, session than I did was able to do on Sunday. But anyway, here we are. So Romans, uh, the letter of Romans was written to the church at Rome. And the only thing you really need to know here is that the church in Rome was made up of Jewish Christians who had come to faith but were being persecuted as both Jews and Christians and then Roman Gentile Christians um, who uh, were also being persecuted by Nero because that they were Christians. So they had this connection of being persecuted but they, they were factions. They were fighting with each other. And Paul was writing to them to say, I want to come and visit you. And he ends up being, getting to Rome by basically being arrested and being taken to Rome to be tried um, in Rome. A uh, very clever story um, and a very clever thing that Paul did there. But anyway, a different story for another day. But he says, by the time I get to you guys, I want you to have sorted your differences out. I think this is the main theme of the book of Romans. That Jews and Gentiles are both Christians, and there shouldn't be a divide between them. Um, and in, in fact, you can see this right at, right at the beginning. Um, uh, if, if you start in, in, in Romans chapter 1, um, uh, you, you can see, uh, right, where, where are we? So Paul's in verse 8, he says, um, you know, I'm, I'm coming to visit you. I, I'm grateful to God that I've got a wonderful message to, to bring to you. I want to come and share all of this with you. And then in verse 14, he says, I'm obligated both to, to Greeks and non-Greeks or Gentiles and non-Gentiles, a weird way to say Jewish people, right? So I'm um, obligated to Greeks and non-Greeks, both to the wise and the foolish. That is why I'm so eager to come and preach to you. 
says, I'm obligated to all of you. I, I, I want to bring you together as a community. I'm not ashamed of the gospel, he says, because it's the power of God that brings salvation to everybody who believes. It first came to the Jewish people because Jesus was Jewish and it started with them. And then it came to the Gentiles and it is now being revealed to everybody. It is a righteousness that is by faith from first to last. It's not based on your background, your ethnicity, your culture, uh, your, your history. It's based on faith. Boom. So now we get to verse 18. He then says, right. Now, what I really want you guys to do is work together as Jewish and Gentile Christians and see your mission field as all the people who are not saved. Because the wrath of God, verse 18, has been revealed against all of the people who are godless and wicked, right? Who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since what may be known about God has been plain to them because God has made it plain to them. God has clearly made himself known and these people have rejected him. Um, so at uh, verse 21, for although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile, their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools. They exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal human beings and birds and animals and reptiles. Now, can you see what he's doing here? He's writing, picture any picture you have in your head of ancient Rome. You can see he's trying to describe this. There's orgies happening all over the place. It's a, it's a vile place to be in. It's a violent place. There's temples everywhere. There's these big statues um, uh, and, and there's idols everywhere. And so Paul's saying, guys, stop fighting with each other and look around you at the godlessness of everything going on around you. Surely that should be your, your focus. And then he's setting them up a little bit. He's saying, Gah! And they are awful, aren't they? I mean, these Romans, these Romans are absolutely awful. Therefore, verse 24, God gave them over in their sinful desires to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with each other. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served created things rather than the creator. Uh, because of this, God gave them over to shameful lusts. Even their women, this is the only time in the Bible, lesbians or lesbian sex is, is referenced. Even their women exchanged natural sexual relations for unnatural ones. Uh, another day we can talk about this, but I wonder what you think unnatural sexual relations are. Actually, the Bible references it twice elsewhere, and in both those cases, it's sex that doesn't produce children. It's not actually weird sex, crazy sex, interesting sexual positions. That's not what Paul's talking about. When he says unnatural sex, he means sex that doesn't produce children. Interesting. And that was something that the Jewish people taught. They, they taught that actually the woman was basically an incubator for the baby. You really should only have sex um, in order to make a, a baby. Anyway, as I say, now I've, now I've told you. I said it for another day, but now I've told you. Anyway, it doesn't, again, it's not direct language. Even their women exchange natural sexual relations for unnatural ones. The Bible hasn't told you what an unnatural sexual act is. You've made the decision and you've put that into the text. You're supposed to be reading the Bible the other way around, letting the text speak for itself. Yeah, okay. In the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed shameful acts with other men, again, no detail, and received in themselves the due penalty for their error, again, no detail. Furthermore, just as they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, so God gave them over to a depraved mind so that they do what they ought not to do. They have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. They are gossip, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. They have no understanding, no fidelity, no love, no mercy. Yeah, so that's a list, right? If you believe that the Bible, that Romans 1, is talking about all 
LGBTQI people of all time, then you have to look at LGBTQI people and you have to tick this list off and say, Whew, you're absolutely right. Every kind of wickedness and evil, every kind of greed and depravity, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, gossip, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, boastful, they disobey their parents. I love that that's snuck into the middle of the list, like it's one of the most horrible things that you can do. Um, I can imagine the parents cheering when they heard that. They have no understanding, no faithfulness, no love, no mercy. Does that describe the gay people you know? Not for me. I mean, I'm sure there are some horrible LGBTQI people in the world. I mean, it's just it's numbers, right? It's statistics. But most of the LGBTQI people I know are, I'll be honest with you, the opposite of all of this, right? The opposite of this list here. But if you believe that this list is God hating LGBTQI people, and this is then what happens, well, then you have to believe that all LGBTQI people are all of these things, and they are not. So something's wrong with the way we've been interpreting this. And I think that the thing that's wrong is you stop reading where I just stopped reading. Because that's not the end of the letter, and it's not even the end of Paul's thoughts. He then says, although they know God's righteous decree that whoever does these things deserves death, they not only continue to do these things, but also improve of others who do them. So you, therefore, I'm keeping on reading. It's the end of the chapter, but the chapters weren't there. This was just a letter. This clearly follows because Paul says, you, therefore. One of the things you must learn about theology is if there's a therefore, you have to work out what it's there for. And so Paul's continuing, you, therefore, have no excuse. You who pass judgment on someone else. For at whatever point you pass judgment on somebody else, you do the same things. Paul's trapped his audience. He's got these Jewish and, and, and Gentile Christians together. And he said, hey, you guys, stop fighting with each other. Why don't you fight with all of the evil, horrible Romans who, who live in Rome? And they are disgusting, aren't they? They are absolutely filthy, disgusting. In their temples, they have sex with each other um, all over the place. There's orgies everywhere. There's, there's violence. All the things, if you've ever watched a, a documentary or a fictional series about ancient Rome, it's a rough place. And Paul says, that's disgusting, isn't it? And you can imagine them all sitting, nodding their heads. Oh, we are very saintly here. We don't do all of those things. And then Paul says, but you but you guys are also sinners. All of us are sinners. We have all fallen short of God's glory. So stop thinking of yourself as superior to everybody else and start doing your job as a Christian, doing your job of bringing love and light into the world and not being disgusted by the world as you see it, but being driven to love, not hate, um, being driven to inclusion, not exclusion. He's going to go on and say all of those things in, in the rest of the letter. But in chapter 2, and you can read it for yourself, he now says, hey, hang on, you Jewish people, you don't like the fact that Romans and Greeks are open to homosexuality. Jews really hated homosexuality and Romans and Greeks were comfortable with it. You don't like that, do you? You don't like that stuff that they do. You also don't like the meat that, that they buy from, from the temples, right? You don't like that. Yeah, I get that. But stop judging, okay? It's got nothing to do with you. If you don't want to eat the meat from the temple, don't, right? It's not an issue, right? Then he turns to the, the Gentiles and he says, and you guys, you hate that circumcision thing that the Jews do, Ugh. okay? You look at that and say, you guys are barbarians, right? Uh, who cares, right? If they want to circumcise their sons, do it. And by the way, spoiler alert, it's going to keep going for another two year, 2,000 years at least, right? They're never going to stop doing it. So don't make it something that divides you guys. You've got different cultural practices. You've got different ways of expressing yourself. Get on with it, right? Later on, he's going to say none of these things 
are, are, are things that make us holy or not holy. What, what you eat and put in your body. Um, in other parts of the Bible, he's, he's going to talk about the fact um, that there is nothing that is prohibited. Nothing. Uh, that you can't do. Everything is permissible. Not everything's beneficial. And then he's also going to flip it around and saying, oh, and just by the way, if, if you're having a Jewish friend come around, don't buy meat from the temple. They don't like it. So don't, don't cause them to have a difficulty thing. And, you know, don't invite them to your circumcision parties. And yeah, don't, you know, if somebody doesn't want to have a gay sex, well, then don't have gay sex with them, right? Can you see the tone? Can you see what Paul's trying to say? Genuinely, go back and read the book of Romans with this view in mind. By the way, this is the only view that makes sense of Romans 9, 10, and 11. If, if you think that Romans is, a, is an early church constitution or is a theological textbook, then Romans 9, 10, and 11 make no sense at all. And, and you can hear some of the great conservative preachers preaching through Romans. And they can take a year to preach through Romans 1 to 8. And then they take one week to do Romans 9, 10, and 11 all in one go. Because it makes no sense to them. But if, if you see what, what the letter to the Romans is about. Jews, you've got your way of worshipping God and a whole lot of cultural baggage that you bring. Romans and Greeks, you've got your way of worshipping God and a whole lot of cultural baggage. Get on with each other. It's just culture, right? You all do it slightly differently. It's brilliant. The main focus needs to be on the fact that Jesus has saved us by faith and that we are now one. We do things differently. God loves diversity. The point is, it's got nothing to do with loving LGBTQI relationships. It's got nothing to do with LGBTQI people. And let me just add something here that was asked as a question on Sunday. What about marriage, right? So, Graham, I hear you, right? Okay, let's, let's accept LGBTQI people. But where's the marriage piece in here? Now, obviously, what would be wonderful for someone like me, who wants to include our LGBTQI friends and family, would be if there was a verse in the Bible that said, hey, gay people are fine. Or, here's an example of a gay marriage. That doesn't exist. So I can't point you to the Bible um, and show you that. We are going to do part two of this at some stage where I am going to show you the affirming parts of the Bible and the inclusive parts of the Bible. But there isn't a direct verse and there isn't an example of a gay relationship in the Bible. Well, there are a few, but we'll come back to that. But there is an obvious one. Um, so what about marriage then? Maybe we should keep marriage sacred because marriage is between a man and a woman. That's the only marriage we see in the Bible. So that was a question that was asked for me on Sunday. I have three responses. The first is, are you sure that marriage is between a man and a woman? I, I, I'll, 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 you contact me, right? I'll put my email address at the end of this. When you find a marriage that is between a man and a woman that lasts for the whole of their lifetime in which neither of them is unfaithful, that produces children, because that's the picture people are telling us is the picture the Bible shows us. If you can find one of those marriages in the Bible, tell me, because it doesn't exist. Maybe Adam and Eve is the only example, but Abraham had multiple wives and he sold one of his wives to the Pharaoh and he slept with his handmaiden. Um, you know, the, the Noah, the, the Lot. Uh, I, I don't know how you get even to like Gen through the book of Genesis in Sunday school, there's so much rape and incest and polygamy and slave trading and misogyny. It's frightening. David, Solomon, you want to go there? Um, uh, Jesus wasn't married, so you can't use him as, as an example. And if marriage is so important, well, tell me the, the wives of the apostles. It's 12 apostles, right? They're all super important. Who were their wives? We know Paul was married. He couldn't have become, uh, he couldn't have got to the level he got to in the Jewish Sanhedrin if he wasn't married. But who was Paul's wife? If marriage is so important, and if if the man, woman, one man, one woman, um, married together for life, if that's the model, show me the model. Show me the model in the Bible. It doesn't exist. Seriously. 
Send me, send me examples of what, where, where you find that in the Bible, because I don't. Uh, uh, interesting, right? Secondly, there's going to be no marriage in heaven. So if the perfection of God, heaven, the perfect state that God wants to, us to be in, doesn't have marriage, is marriage as important as some of us make it out to be? Maybe it isn't. Maybe marriage is a convenience thing. Um, and thirdly, why is marriage set up as such an important thing? And the theologians will tell you it's marriage is a sacrament because marriage is a picture, an image, an analogy of our relationship with God. And that's why, the conservatives will say, that's why we can't have gay people getting married. Because it messes up the picture of our relationship with God. In what way does it? In what way does your one man, one woman marriage create a picture of God that gay marriage would break? Is, has God got gender? God, by the way, if you remember, in the Christian God, is three in one. Not, not two. God is three. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Um, there's no marriage there. And those labels, Father, Son, are not really a gender. God doesn't have a gender. We just use that language because it's convenient language. But God doesn't have a gender. God's not going to have sex, right? So it's not the sexual act that, that is the analogy for our relationship with God. Yeah, that, that would be weird. Um, what is it? The main defining feature of our relationship with God is love. That God loves us and invites us to love God. And so as long as your marriage is a marriage where you become one, where the entities come together and you now share your life and your futures are intertwined, where you will give your lives for each other, where you share everything, where your love is deep and profound and exclusively, that level of love is exclusively for each other. That's the analogy, right? That's why marriage is a great picture of our relationship with God. But it doesn't require us to have a man and a woman. You could have those two happening with two men. David loved Jonathan more than a husband loves a wife. For David and Jonathan, that relationship was the more perfect picture of the relationship uh, that we have with, with God. Again, I'm not saying David and Jonathan had a homosexual relationship. Maybe they did. Maybe they didn't. The Bible doesn't say. But I'm saying that the analogy, the picture of marriage, is not a picture of a man and a woman. It's a picture of deep love. And so it could be two men having love. It could be two women. And by the way, just to freak you out a little bit, it could be polygamous. It could be multiple partners. Because the Bible is filled with marriages of multiple partners. And I, the New Testament kind of suggests in Greek culture that it's better for the leaders of the church at least to only have one wife. Um, but that's not a general rule, right? That's just in that culture, in that time for the leaders of the church that is a suggestion and Paul even says this is me talking not God um, uh, when, when he says that um, it's there you can go and read this stuff if you want to you can as long as you are showing the type of love that God shows to us your marriage is a marriage that God will bless because it's a picture of who God is. That's what I believe the Bible is saying to us. That God loves us and wants us to love him and each other and ourselves with the same kind of love that he loves us. Which is a love that knows no barriers and boundaries. That does not care about culture or race or gender or creed or class. That doesn't care about gender or sex or sexual orientation but loves deeply, loves consensually, loves in order to be loved in return. 
And when that love is returned, consensually and with responsibility, we've created something magical. So in all honesty, I don't think the Bible is trying to answer the question about gay marriage. I don't think it's a question the Bible considers. I think the Bible just says, if you love deeply and want to love in a God-like way somebody else, then you can, that's marriage. Go for it. Genuinely, I think that's what the Bible says. That might be a step too far for some of you. It took me a long time to go on the journey from where I started in a very conservative Christian environment to where I am today. So maybe it's going to take the time it takes for you. Maybe you'll start with the Old Testament and you'll take time to, to get to the New Testament. Maybe you'll get through Corinthians and Timothy and it'll take you time to reevaluate Romans 1. Maybe you'll get to accepting LGBTQI people and it'll take you more time to accept LGBTQI marriage. Take the time you need to take. Know that at We Are Church, we will give you that time. We'll, we'll hurry you along if, you, if you're quite far behind. We'll, we'll invite you to move quickly, but we'll allow you to take the time. And we'll support you and answer any and all of your questions. And we'll help you along that journey. Let me finish with this, and I've gone on way too long. Thank you for watching. I don't think that the most important question is what does the Bible say? I do think that's a great question, and I do think that we should ask that question, and I do think that the Bible says some very good stuff, and I think that what the Bible does say about sexual ethics um, and LGBTQI people, we should listen to. You just heard an hour of me explaining the Bible to you, and I think we should listen to what the Bible says. And I don't think it says what we thought it said, but I think that we should still listen to it. But I don't think that we should be obsessing about what does the Bible say. Because for most people, the Bible can say anything. Genuinely. You can pick a topic. We could literally pick a topic of, is it better to wear dark blue shirts or red shirts. And I bet you that we could get some theologians in the room and we could find Bible verses to support our view. Because the Bible is not a constitution. It's not a rule book. It's not a textbook. It's not an encyclopedia. It is largely a record of God's encounters with people, various individuals and groups of people over the course of a few thousand years, captured in mainly narrative and often poetic and sometimes prophetic uh, forms that is more of an invitation for us to join that story. An invitation to recognize a God who loves us and who invites us to love God. And it's not meant to be used as a debating tool. Instead of asking, what does the Bible say? We should either, rather ask, who is God? And what I mean by that is instead of saying, what does the Bible say about a topic? We should say, how does God engage with this issue? So what does the Bible say about slavery? Well, the Bible says you can own a slave and you just mustn't beat your slave to death. What does God believe about slavery? Does God believe that one human being should own another? I doubt it. If God is love and God expects love and God gives love, then in what way can we express love to the people who work for us and the people who have financial relationships with us? who are indebted to us. What would love look like in that environment? That's the question. And once we've understood what we believe God to be, we can then go to the Bible and say, here's where I find that in the Bible. Here's where I find evidence for that view. 
So who is God in relationship to LGBTQI people? Well, you're going to have to fight me if you say that LGBTQI people do not have the image of God in them. You're going to have to fight me if you want to say that LGBTQI people are not loved by God. God's image is in everybody, and God loves everybody. God created LGBTQI people, and God loves them, and He loves them the way He created them. And now that we know that that's what God is and who God is, we can go and read our Bible and realize that's what the Bible says too. The final most important question is who does God want us to be? What we are trying to be at We Are Church is a space that LGBTQI people can come to. We're not a gay church. Uh, we're not a church that's only for homosexual people. And in fact, we don't want to be a church that only talks about homosexual issues or LGBTQI issues. But we want to be a church where LGBTQI people know that they can come and be who they are and become better versions of who God created them to be, to become, in fact, the best versions of who God created them to be, which would be the versions of themselves, of LGBTQI people who love themselves and are therefore loving towards others, who are lovable by others, and who love God and know that they are loved. That's what you're going to find at We Are Church. Thank you for coming to a very long TED Talk. I hope this is useful. And if you have any questions or comments, feel free to contact us at We Are Church. Uh, the best contact for We Are Church is Jane at codrington.biz. I'll put it on the screen. Jane at codrington.biz. That's my wife. And she facilitates our community. Be in touch. We'd love to help you walk whatever part of the journey you're on on this topic. Go with God. Go in peace. Go and love.